So next we're going to talk about SVTs. SVTs are where people kind of get a lot of anxieties and headaches from because you have AVNRT, you have AVRT. Um, when we start to talk about physiology, you start thinking about the slow fast pathways, the accessory pathways, and it could all get jumbled really quickly. However, what's nice is when it comes to the clinical side of things, it doesn't really matter which one's AVNRT and which one's uh, AVRT. You just have to recognize that this is an SVT. So first, let's talk about AVNRT. So what is AVNRT? AVNRT is atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. It's the most common uh, SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. And many of these patients, whenever they have um, this, they will be symptomatic. So they will have feelings of their heart racing, they'll have lightheadedness, they'll feel dizzy, and their heart rate will actually be very, very high. So these patients, their heart rates could range from 150 all the way up to the 200s. So these patients, when you get an EKG, you see those QRS complexes being really, really close together. When we look at the EKG, one of the things that you can see in AVNRT is retrograde P waves. And what that means is that the P wave is after the QRS complex. Because um, without going deeply into the pathophysiology, the SVT is going through the AV node and it's not coming from the SA node. So the P wave, the SA um, node, is still firing at its normal rate and it's depolarizing the atria but it's happening kind of separately from the uh, tachycardia, which is coming from the AV node. So you can imagine if you don't really see the P wave sometimes, if they're buried in the T wave, it's very hard to differentiate this from sinus tach. And that's where looking at the telemetry, like we mentioned in the uh, prior video, can come in handy because if you see on the telemetry that the heart rate all of a sudden shot up from like 70s or 80s to 150s, 160s, you should be thinking SVT. However, if it gradually went up from a normal heart rate to a really high heart rate, you should be thinking sinus tech. So let's look at an example here. Here we have nicely circled, in looking at V1, um, some of these retrograde P waves. So you see this QRS complex, you see this little bump right after the P wave, or right after the QRS uh, complex, and that's the P wave. It's not the T wave because if you see the rhythm strips below it, so the precordial lead V2 and V3, you see the T waves there, and if you line them up a little bit higher, you see that it's probably this negative deflection in V1, that that's the T wave, so this positive deflection here is like the, the P wave, so this is a retrograde P wave. This patient's heart is going at about 300, 150 beats per minute, so it's tachycardic, so this is a regular, it's beating regularly, it's narrow, so it's a regular narrow complex tachycardia, and because it has retrograde P waves, you know that this is an SVT. Here's another example. Here, as you can see, the rate's a little bit faster, so it's almost one big box. So this patient's heart rate is almost going at 300 beats per minute, so really, really fast. I bring this EKG up because you can see how it's really hard to see the P waves here. So if you look at two, you don't really see the P waves. If you look at V1, which sometimes you can see nice P waves, you don't see it there. So this is a nice example of how, you know, the prior EKG, you saw these nice retrograde P waves, but here you don't see it at all. So this can be very hard to differentiate between um, sinus tachycardia and SVT, but another thing that could kind of help you realize that this is more so an SVT is because of the heart rate. Sinus tach normally doesn't go this fast, and SVT can. So whenever you see something like this, think that you're going to have to treat this patient for SVT. So treatments. One of the first things that we do for SVT is vagal maneuvers. So we've heard about a lot of vagal maneuvers. Those were, there's Valsalva, there's crowd massage, there's cold water. Each of them have their benefits um, and some of their cons. So Valsalva, one of the problems with it is many patients don't know what you're talking about when you tell them to bear down. You tell them to bear down, they just kind of like close their mouth, squeeze like maybe their belly or something, and sometimes they actually do it correctly, but sometimes not. So what I've actually, what I found to be helpful is you tell the patients to blow through a straw. So if they have a food tray next to them, you basically take out a straw, you have them blow through that because that kind of um, tenses up your abdominal muscles and creates a valsalva maneuver. 
If you don't have that, what you can do is you can actually have them have um, grab a syringe, just like a sterile saline syringe. You take out the saline, take out the plunger, which is the kind of uh, push pushing part of the syringe, and you have them blow through that empty syringe because that's basically acts as a straw and will also help them tense up the abdominal muscles, creating a bell salvo maneuver. The other thing you can do is a carotid massage. The key thing here is you don't want to do it on both carotids because then you'll decrease blood flow through the brain and that's not what you want to do. And also if someone is a vasculopath and they have known atherosclerosis, you don't want to be massaging those carotids too hard. You usually don't want to massage them at all because you're at risk at creating a thrombus by breaking off some of the atherosclerosis goes to the brain and causes a stroke. Lastly, um, you can do cold water to kind of create this vagal response. That's mainly used in kids, um, but in adults it's almost never used. Sometimes you see it in TV, but I, if you throw cold water at a patient, one, the patient will be pissed, and then so will the nurses and all the staff because you have to clean all that up. It's probably not going to work, so just don't bother using cold water as a vagal maneuver. There's also something called the modified Valsalva, and this is actually on up to date, um, and it's actually interesting. So what they recommend is you basically have the patient do a Valsalva maneuver by either bearing down or blowing through a straw, whatever it may be. You have them do that for 15 seconds, sitting up. Then when they stop that, you actually lie them flat and you lift up their legs um, for another 15 seconds. And supposedly by doing that, the blood kind of rushes back um, into the carotid, distends the carotid arch, um, creating basically a stronger vagal response. And supposedly it works 60 to 80% of the time. I haven't done it yet, um, so I'm not sure if that works, but it is something to know about that could be used um, in patients that are stable and that you could kind of move around easily. So if you do the vagal maneuvers, they don't work. The next thing you want to do is give medications. So the main medications for SVT are, is adenosine. So whenever you give adenosine, um, there's a few doses that you should know. You should know the first dose is usually six milligrams, followed by 12 milligrams, followed by 12 milligrams. The key with adenosine is that it's very, very short acting and it um, kind of breaks down within three to five seconds. So it's important for that medication to get to the heart really quickly so that it can act um, on on the heart to break the SVT. The key thing is to push the medication really quickly, flush it with a lot of saline, and usually I've seen nurses do this as well as lift up the arm so that the medication gets to the heart quickly. Whenever you're giving adenosine to an awake patient, always, always, always prep them beforehand knowing that uh, telling them that they're going to get this medication and that they will feel a lot of discomfort. I've actually had attendings basically tell patients that you will feel like you're having a heart attack, you will feel like there's an elephant sitting on your chest because what you're doing is you're basically stopping this person's heart and they will feel that. So it's really important to prep the patient beforehand um, if their mental status is okay so that they, they don't kind of get even more freaked out than they already are probably by the SVT. So if you do vagal maneuvers, that doesn't work. If you give adenosine, that doesn't work. Then one of the next things you could do is you could start an uh, ESMO drip, but by this time you're probably talking to a cardiologist and they're trying to figure out what to do next. Next we have AVRTs, and these are atrial ventricular re-entry tachycardias. These are the accessory pathways. So AVNRT, nodal re-entry tachycardia, is the one we just talked about, goes through the AV node, while this one has the accessory pathway specifically the Wolf-Parkinson-White um, syndrome. So the key here on the EKG is that these patients have a short PR interval and they have the delta wave. Here I just have two schematics um, showing that these AVRTs can go either orthodromically, which is clockwise, or antidromically, which is counterclockwise. And this will be important for the EKGs because if it's going orthodromically, it's still going down the Hisperkinji system, so you're going to have a narrow complex tachycardia. But once you go antidromically, or antidromically straight into the ventricle and then up the Hisperkinji, you're going to have slower depolarization, so you're actually going to have a wide complex tachycardia. And we'll show you that in a sec. 
So looking at this EKG and kind of looking at the strips at the bottom, looking at 2 and V1 or V5, we see that this is a narrow complex regular tachycardia and it's going very, very fast. It's going at 300, 150 beats per minute. And you see, you don't really see any P waves here. You see these T waves and then it's going really quickly, really quickly, really quickly. Then you have this pause and then you start having a normal sinus rhythm. So what happened here, this pause was created by the adenosine that was given. These pauses sometimes, whenever you give adenosine, could be a few seconds. So it's definitely very anxiety provoking whenever you push this medication because sometimes these patients have these very long pauses um, before they start getting their intrinsic rate that starts beating. But looking at these beats right here, especially in V4, V5, V6, we see these nice delta waves. So we broke the SVT with the adenosine, and then we started seeing this morphology of the delta wave in the QRS complex, knowing that this is probably an AVRT that caused this SVT. Here we have two examples. So on the top, we have a normal sinus rhythm. This patient's heart rate is a little less than 100. And you see here that the delta wave isn't as prominent. So you don't see it that well in the inferior leads. You don't see it as well in the um, precordial leads. But then this patient actually had an antidronic tachycardia. So their AVRT was now going in the counterclockwise direction, going down the accessory pathway into the ventricle, and it causes this wide complex narrow tachycardia. So we'll talk about this in a later video, but I just kind of wanted to show you that you could sometimes have this uh, morphology or sometimes this in these tachycardias. So it's really important to know that uh, AVRTs or patients that have these accessory pathways can have different morphologies of their tachycardias. Treatment for AVRT is the same as for AVNRT. You could do vagal maneuvers, you give adenosine. Um, however, if you know that this is being caused from, let's say, World of Parkinson White, you can treat these patients with procainamide. The most important thing about treatment for AV, um, AVRT is you do not want to give beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. The important thing is here um, is that if you give those, you can kill the patient because what that does is it slows down the beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers slows down conduction through the AV node, which basically then prefers the conduction down the accessory pathway, which is the wide complex tachycardia that we just showed, and you could cause these patients to decompensate really quickly. So it's important that when you have these narrow complex regular tachycardias and you're concerned for an SVT, um, and you are concerned that you might have an accessory pathway, you avoid beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and just stick with the vagal maneuvers and the adenosine.